Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 44. Hmm, you sound apostate. With Laureen Yandrup, I'm Mark Kane. If you're new to this podcast, Unitarian Christians are those who believe that God is one person. It's the Father. The one sitting at God's right hand, that's a uniquely wonderful man. The one God, the Ancient of Days, gave him that position of authority. If that language sounds foreign to you, perhaps you believe that God is a tripersonal being. You may not know exactly what that means or how that works. You may swap out father and son arbitrarily without thinking. You may just avoid talking about it. But you've been told it is correct thinking. To be a Christian is to believe in the Trinity, even if you don't know for sure what it is you're believing. So if that's you, and especially if you're new here, this may be triggering some odd feelings. You may be shuddering and thinking, this is heresy, and if Pastor fill in the blank knew I was listening, it would not go well. You might right now be reaching for the stop button on your player. Please don't pause. Just consider. Listen and consider. Is it really you? who is scared to touch a topic like this? Or is it an external pressure that has made a home in you? Are you scared because of others, your reputation, your pastor who says some very harsh things about people who listen to stuff like this? Are you scared because someone told you over and over that people like me are going to burn in hell? Or they are the types to likely be struck down by lightning and you definitely don't want to be anywhere near that? Or are you scared because you simply know from the quietness of your soul that questioning your longtime beliefs and considering alternative interpretations about Scripture is really, truly bad? What is the motivation here? I'm going to loosely categorize faith groups into two types. <laughs> loosely. It's actually a spectrum, a gradient. But for our purposes today, there are just two general types. Type 1, groups which see themselves as the true church, the true faith, and the true gospel organization. Or type 2, groups which don't. Note, both kinds of groups are filled with people who believe that they have the truth, that's common to all groups, obviously. The key here is that Group 1 has effectively become the structural organizational manifestation of truth. In the beginning was the truth, and the truth became an organization. <laughs> well, uh, specifically, the third-day hypo-Adventist full gospel disciples of the real Messiah remnant brethren. I think that's the true church name, I will be sure to double-check my notes before I release this. The truth, for Group 1, is embedded and infused into the organization itself. In Group 2, they would not see themselves so highly. Truth, for Type 2 groups, is a bit more dispersed among the people. The premier examples of Group 1 believe they are the true church to an extent that you must be a member to be saved. It's not uncommon. There are group ones which don't go that far, or at least don't proclaim that out loud, but they may function as though it is true. So why are we talking about this? I want you to become better at discernment. I want you to be equipped with adequate understanding so that you can detect when something is going wrong. In a world where one individual can amass a following of hundreds of thousands in mere days, thanks social media, you need a nose for spiritual stench. You know how it is when you get an email or a text message that tells you that your computer has been compromised and you need to click here to fix it? <laughs> Years ago, people didn't know enough to not click that stuff. And now we know. We have grown in our understanding of cybercriminals, 
we recognize the patterns of fishing that are used to hook us and draw us in. We have, mostly, burned it into our mind that if something sounds too good to be true on the Internet, you're the 10,000th person to visit this site. Click here to accept your $500 reward. Then you know it probably is too good to be true. And you delete it. You don't click. This is what awareness and understanding does. It's a light to your path. I believe it's helpful to recognize when a church is positioning itself into group one, especially if you attend and are actively embedded in that church. Something spiritually dangerous grows in this kind of cathedral. External impetus, pressure to conform. It's a system to which you must bow. If you accept its cup and drink it, you owe a kind of allegiance. It's an allegiance to an organization. You are obligated, even if subconsciously, to defend it, to protect it, and to not look critically into its darker corners. In the darkest corners of some of these powerful groups are vile abuses of power. There may be a trail of victims left scarred for life by the betrayal of what should have been godly goodness, but which revealed itself behind closed doors as pure evil. But it's a spiritual corporation, and its survival is essential. It's mission righteous, and its guilty leaders shielded, for as long as possible, at least. This can happen. It's a natural dynamic of power. And in a type 1 church, power is distilled and concentrated. If you are a leader in the true, righteous church of churches, you are very important. People get lost in that importance. And I fear that many are ruined beyond repair. The word cult gets used a lot these days. I did for a while, and when I used it, here's what I was meaning. Any group that employs manipulation and control to garner conformity. I asked on the UCA Facebook page a while back, and I got a few other answers. Kirby said, For me, if you aren't given the option to use your own brain, you're in a cult. <laughs> Anthony wrote, My definition of a cult is a group or organization who claims exclusive authority from God and uses such authority to rule over others. <laughs> These are both really good. Then there's my longtime Presbyterian neighbor friend. Scott says this, Any group that won't tell you what you're getting into when you join. <laughs> That's nice and simple. I asked another friend, an evangelical fundamentalist type, and he said this, a group that denies the doctrine of the deity of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Hmm. That definition is more popular than I think it should be. It's easy to get that right, to check the deity of Christ box, and then rule your church with an iron, manipulative, and charismatic fist. <laughs> but hey, they got that checkbox right. I don't use that term cult much anymore because it's confusing. It has broad definitions, and it has these somewhat contrived theological meanings. <laughs> Shoot, for some groups, it would almost seem that a cult is any organization that disagrees with us. <laughs> then I saw some of what Laureen was doing, and she used a term which I think says it well, high-control religious groups. That seems more useful. I suspect there may be some high-control groups which are not very dangerous. Maybe they are very transparent and upfront with the expectations for members. And maybe they make it easy to leave. Maybe. So maybe not every high-control group is dangerous. But I have little doubt that every deeply religious, dangerous group is a high-control group. I discussed an aspect of this danger in Episode 35, the Spirit of Error. If you're intrigued at what I'm saying now, episode 35 is definitely for you. 
Laureen knows of what she speaketh. Thirty years in a high-control group, she was a Jehovah's Witness. Now, likely this question popped into your mind. Mark, do you think the JW organization is a cult? Well, I just explained that I don't like that term. But I will say it is clearly a high-control religious group. I believe a lot of organizations are high-control, top-heavy, leader-admiring, dangerous groups. JWs are just one among many. My problem with these groups is really with the leadership. They will be held to a higher standard, so I don't feel it out of place to point my attention there. The members, on the other hand, are to varying degrees victims of these leaders. And some of these people have a long way to dig to get out of the mess. It is not easy. I have hope for these people and respect for the challenging road ahead of them. Lorraine does too, and for her, it's become a ministry. Lorraine, I appreciate that you're joining me today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I saw your name pop up on the UCA conference list. I couldn't remember talking to you, so I reached out to you through Facebook, and I found out, well, you weren't actually there. (laughs) Yes, I very much wanted to be at the first conference, but unfortunately or fortunately, we were in the process of selling our home in New Jersey, so I had to stay with the kids so my husband could go take care of things in New Jersey. Uh I I live in Florida now, so. Well, maybe next year we'll get another shot. Definitely. Yeah. So how did you first find out about the UCA? Well, it took me a while to figure out what to call myself, because I was running into people on YouTube that I'm like, yeah, I believe like they do. I believe like they do. But they didn't really say what they were. Anthony Buzzard was one of the first ones I found. Mm -hmm. He did mention the word Unitarian. So I Googled that. It brought me to the universal ones. Yeah, I'm like, that doesn't sound like what I believe and definitely not what he believes. (laughs) So it took me a while. Uh. You know, coming out of The Jehovah's Witnesses, which is a very organized religion. Mm -hmm. There's kingdom halls in every town. I wanted to know what people who believed like me, where they met, where they worshiped, because I wanted to be with them. And I was very dismayed to find out there wasn't that many biblical Unitarian type churches. Mm -hmm. Um, There was pockets of them, but I didn't happen to live in a pocket. There isn't a church in the whole state of Florida that I know of. A handful of people which I have reached out to through your site. Mm. But um, I was starting to follow Dale Tuggy, Sean Finnegan, and Dustin Smith. Yeah. And I kept saying they need to have an organization. They need to have a way to get together with people who aren't Trinitarian believers, you know? Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden it popped up in my YouTube that you guys were forming this alliance. I said, that's fantastic. That's great. <laughs> I understood that it wasn't another church. You weren't forming a religious group, but it was people who could at least agree on some key ingredients. And that was that God is not a Trinity. Yeah. Because, you know, all my choices around me right now are Trinitarian churches. Mm -hmm. And I much rather funnel that down a little bit and at least be with non-Trinitarian believers, even if we might have some differences in in some other areas. So yeah. I haven't talked specifically yet here on the podcast with somebody who's describing or coming out of a Jehovah's Witness situation. So let's hear your story going back to the earlier days. Yeah, well, I was interviewed by Tracy from KOG Missions okay, and Carlos from Restoration Fellowship. I put my coming out story mm-hmm. on YouTube. So I'll give you the links to that. Yes. And then if people want to hear the long version, <laughs> they <laughs> yes. can. But I grew up not having a religious background. Like I believed in God, but I never had any formal training. When I was 25, I met my husband and he was studying with the Jehovah's Witnesses. So to make a long story short, I became a Jehovah's Witness eventually. Mm. But they did answer some questions that I was having. Mm. Three main things. Initially, my husband didn't say Jehovah. We just talked about the Bible. And I kept a journal like, dear God, can I please have a man that loves you that isn't a wimp? You know. So I felt he was the answer to my prayers. And he, on one of our marathon conversations, slipped and said Jehovah. I'm like, Jehovah, Jehovah. That's one of those weird religions. <laughs> I said, you said Jehovah. He goes, well, yeah, that's God's name. I'm like, what? 
And so we talked about that a little bit. And then he admitted that he was studying with Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, then I was going to try and save him. Uh Uh, Unfortunately, the tools of the trade back then were the library, because I'm Mm. so old, Mark, that there was no computers, there was no cell phones. So I did the best I could, but I did prove that God did have a name. And, Mm. you know, so so I was kind of amazed by that because I had never heard that in my whole, you know, 25 years. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I was struggling with the death of my stepbrother. He was 12. He died in a fire. I accepted when my grandparents died, but when he died, I'm like, well, where is he? Is he in heaven? Does he stay 12 forever? So all of a sudden I started to have questions. Well, they helped me to appreciate the concept of sleep of the dead sleeping until the resurrection. I said, that made a lot of sense to me. Hmm. And then the third thing was I had heard roughly about the Trinity. Mm -hmm. I did date a gentleman who would go to church because his mother made him and he would do the genuflux. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, you know, the father, the son, the Holy Ghost. I'm like, there's ghosts in church. (laughs) And so I I definitely needed a lot of education. They tried to explain it to me. It didn't make sense. And so now I'm learning from the Jehovah's Witnesses that God is an eternity. That made sense to me. So mm. once I proved those three things to myself and that they weren't lying or making it up, I trusted everything else. Mm. That was my mistake. I should have always stayed a Berean and always verified everything. That's kind of how I became a Jehovah's Witness. And I was a Jehovah's Witness for 30 years. Okay. Because I didn't become one till later in life, I was 25, I was college educated. Jehovah's Witnesses discourage their people from becoming college educated because they feel that pulls them into the world, you know, that sort of thing. And there are dangers, but still, yeah, not really yeah. good advice. So I have always been entrepreneurial. I started to run a business. And in hindsight now, I realize I was having what they call cognitive dissonance. Hmm. I was trying to hold two beliefs that didn't agree with each other. Like on one hand, they're saying you don't want to make a lot of money. But I was an entrepreneur, and that's what entrepreneurs do. It's not because you're being greedy or materialistic. It's just, it's almost like a hobby. It's what you do. You're building something. You're crafting something. Okay. And then I would like, okay, but I can't make too much. And it would be like this tension always, you know? A good Jehovah's Witness went out in the ministry. You know, we're the ones that knock on your doors. And if you're really good, you went out more than just on Saturday. You went out once during the week. And then if you had time, you were expected to pioneer, which is full time. Okay. So when I moved to Florida three years ago, I did have the gift of time. I I built my business up to the point where I had a manager running everything. Mm. So what's a good JW do? They become a pioneer. Uh It was in pioneer school where I had this pivotal aha moment where all the things throughout the 30 years that maybe bothered me, you know, I'd put it up on the shelf. I had a sister tell me, just put it up on the shelf. Jehovah will take care of it later. You know, you don't have to understand everything. Hmm. So my shelf was getting kind of heavy, you know, (laughs) things like the blood transfusion thing. Oh yeah. Or the disfellowshipping policy. And the way I saw a lot of the women being treated, Pioneer was about as big as a deal as you could get, or you could be the wife of a circuit overseer or an elder, or you mm. know, <laughs> which I wasn't really a feminist or anything like that, but I noticed it. But because I had this other outlet in building my business, I I guess it didn't impact me that much. Oh, okay. But I remember silly things like wearing they're called culottes. It's like pants that look like a skirt, and I got counseled because it wasn't a skirt. The men couldn't have beards. And my brother, who was studying, he said, why are they telling me what kind of facial hair I can have? So those are some of the things I had to put up on the shelf, you know? Yeah, yeah. And watching a good friend of mine suffer from a lot of verbal abuse from her her husband, who had a lot of position. Mm. And so, you know, all these things were kind of adding up. So now I'm in pioneer school. Yeah. And the brother says, as pioneers, you're going to be looked up to. And you need to be up to date on all the latest changes. And I remember thinking, what's he talking about? Latest changes. I know once in a while we'd have a clarification, like the last one I could remember is what does Gog of Magog represent? So I'm like, ah, oh, they must be talking about that. And he told us how to do that and to go to their website, wol.jw.org, and type in beliefs clarified in the search box. So I had my iPad with internet. So I did it right then and there. And this huge list. And you know how you scroll with iPads on yeah, yeah. scroll and scroll and scroll. And I was just amazed at how much changes there were. And I'm like, Jehovah's Witnesses feel that they are God's true organization on earth. 
and that the governing body is spirit directed. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking if you're spirit directed, how could we get so much wrong? How could there need to be so much correction? Now they would call it new light and almost spin it to where we would get excited if there was new light, you know? And I'm like, really God's spirit can't communicate with you clear enough that we get it right the first time. Hmm. In that moment, I just knew. And Hmm. now I think it was Holy Spirit were moments before I was planning on being a pioneer to the end of the system Yeah. to, I'm like, there's something seriously wrong here. I need to investigate. Yeah. So I came home and I told my husband that what I learned in pioneer school is that I don't know diddly. And I needed to spend the next year studying my Bible. He said, okay, I'll support you in that. And I treated it as a full-time job. I decided rather than getting influenced by other organized religion or other Christian thoughts out there that I wanted to read my Bible first, just me and my Bible. Mm -hmm. And I decided to start with the New Testament because the whole Bible overwhelmed me. So at least if I did the New Testament, I knew I was going to get into Jesus' words right away. And I was kind of looking for some things like, was this Trinity thing something that I missed? Is that in there? is there a two-class system? Like Jehovah's Witnesses teachers, an anointed class and an earthly class. I was of the earthly class. They were going to heaven. We were going to be staying on the earth. And there was only 144,000 anointed. So at this point then, it sounds like you're you're looking at all the things that you were being taught and considering the possibility that they were in error. Were you doing this like behind the scenes that the Jehovah's Witnesses didn't understand that? I mean, you're... Because... Yeah. You're not supposed to do that. Well, that's that's when I realized that I was in a cult. I mean, I never thought of it as a cult ever, ever, ever. And we would joke, yeah, people think we're in a cult or we're brainwashed. And when I told my husband that I was going to study the Bible, you know, he's just like, okay, it's studying the Bible. I kind of knew deep down, even though I wasn't really admitting it yet, that everything was going to change. I just knew it. I knew I was opening Pandora's box because mm. I never really did a deep dive. I said I was going to. It was always that year's goal, but I never did. They keep you so busy. You're going out in the ministry. You're going to two or three meetings a week. Mm. So I did that read through the Bible, and I did it in six weeks because I said, I'm going to read it like Gone with the Wind. I'm not going to stop because I, I love to research things and look things up. Yeah. And I had never done that other than using the JW app to research things. Now I had the whole world and it's like the wild, wild west out there. Mm -hmm. So I said, no, I'm just going to read and see what my brain that God gave me tells me it's saying. Mm. And when I did that, I came away that there is no Trinity. I saw father, son, father, son, father, son. Mm. I did not see a two-class system. And Jesus became more prominent in my mind. We believe in Jesus as Jehovah's Witnesses, but somehow he's minimized. I can't quite articulate it. We believe he's the son of God. We believe he's at the right hand of God, but yet he's not given the honor that I feel that he's really due. And we definitely don't develop a relationship with him. Mm. And we're even considered not children of God. We are friends of God because they're the anointed. They are sons of God. They have Christ as their mediator. We, the average rank and file JW, doesn't. But we're so conditioned, we don't even realize it. And the anointed is is the subgroup of Jehovah's Witnesses. Is that the 144,000? Yep. It's okay. 144,000. They have a governing body, which right now is eight men. They are anointed. And every year we have the memorial of Christ's death. I say we, I, I don't identify as a Jehovah's Witness anymore, but I can't <laughs> help it, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. But we celebrate the memorial of Christ's death. And if you're anointed, you partake of the bread and wine. If you're not, you pass it. So there's hardly any anointed left. And so you would go, you get all dressed up. It's the biggest event of the year and you pass it. What I say now, I got chastised for it, but I'm sorry, I stand by it. I feel like it was a mass rejection of Christ. Mm. And I'm horrified that I participated in that, that way, but I didn't know better. And I know Jesus, and God forgive me. Um, So yeah, so that's the anointed. And the number is supposed to go down each year. And when I first came in, it was the the number of anointed, because they would keep stats. And it was coming down. There's only a few thousand left. And then people started to partake. And then we'd have articles. Well, like, are you really sure? And, you know, my daughter, when she was 10, like, well, how do you know you're anointed? 
I said, well, it's kind of like a feeling, like, you know, you're not meant to live on the earth forever. She goes, a feeling? But what if someone lies? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, kids these days. It's it's true. It's true. (laughs) So I was doing Bible study, but I was also watching (laughs) XJW videos on YouTube. (sighs) And yeah, exactly. You're not (laughs) supposed to do that. You're not supposed to look up your own religion online because- it's full of apostate lies and you don't want to expose yourself to that. And I, I never did. I can't believe I never did it. Hmm. So I remember the day I was in my bed with my laptop and I was about to start doing research on governing body and things like that. And I knew it would be frowned upon, but I, you know, I wanted to know, and I'm, I'm literally hesitating. Now here I was a grown woman I used a different phrase in my mind. You are a grown blank woman. You can look up whatever you want. (laughs) And the truth can withstand scrutiny. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with verifying things. It took a while for me to give myself permission. But once I did the search, I'm telling you within hours, I'm like, and I saw all this stuff and all these people and YouTube's just full of them. Mm -hmm. It was, um, the range of emotions you go through was very scary. And I was shaking. My, I was literally shaking as I'm doing this, this search. Because your whole world, your whole world is centered around your faith, going to the kingdom hall, and you don't realize how tied up it is in it. It's not like just a church you go to. It's a lifestyle. Hmm. So I had accounts in different names. My name growing up is Lori Jane. My real name's Laureen. So I opened up a new Amazon account in Lori Jane, because there was books I wanted to order on Kindle that I didn't want to be seen on our family account. Mm. Um, There were movies I wanted to watch that were not JW approved, so I would watch it on that account. I got a different Gmail account. Like this whole different persona came out. And then what made me realize I was in a cult was the fact that I had to go through that process just to look up information about my own religion. Hmm. Once I got the information, you know, you want to talk to people about it. You want to process your emotions about it and your anger. And I felt I was lied to about things. And I realized I didn't have a soul I could talk to about it without it risking me getting outed and Hmm. disfellowshipped. And I wasn't ready for that yet. I felt like I couldn't even really talk to my own husband yet. So I did a lot of this the first few weeks on my own. And it was a very depressing time. It was, I couldn't talk to people from work because they were my employees and then it would look kind of just weird. I couldn't talk to my family because I wasn't ready to hear I told you so, because my family's not Jehovah's Witnesses. So it was, it was very isolating. Hmm. And that's how I realized I was in a cult. I saw it as a purposeful thing to isolate people that dare to question. Because, you know, like body snatchers, you know, where they point, ah, you know, like if you <laughs> say something that's off script, that isn't the accepted narrative, they, people look at you with a raised eyebrow and like, mm, you sound apostate, you know? Mm. So, yeah. Well, your experience with that in the last few years since being a part of the UCA, I have met several XJWs or JWs in the process of making the move out. But I could tell some of these people were nowhere near ready to talk about it like on a podcast because there were still a lot of family ties that had to be managed mm-hmm. what was going to happen when this person found out you're right I, that's a a sign that something is wrong if the process of pursuing truth mm-hmm. results in you feeling like you can't talk to anybody and you have to hide there's a problem yes how did you come out and be able to at least talk about it and relax i mean You ended up on a podcast here. (laughs) Well, for me, I didn't have as much skin in the game, like those entanglements you were talking about. Mm -hmm. I was in a new town. I'd only been here a year. So I had formed some new friendships here locally. Okay. But I realized that they were very superficial friendships if I couldn't tell them what was on my heart without fear of harming my family. Because I hadn't told my kids yet. I did start to tell my husband. He was like freaking out. And then I had one friend who was like a mother to me. She's the one that introduced me to this area of Florida. And I did tell her a little bit of what was going on. And of course, it panicked her. And then I kind of backpedaled and didn't say so much anymore and just said, you know, I'm, I just don't see the correctness of following eight men 
in New York that tell us women must wear skirts, men must wear beards. It's not a big deal. I can suck it up. It, but to me, it's being pharisaical. It's adding to what the Bible says. And that's what Jesus came to condemn. He condemned the Pharisees for adding more burden to the people. Hmm. And I saw the leadership doing that. And that's what I was telling her. Um, she was the only one I told besides my husband, mm -hmm. because my goal was never to pull people out of the Jehovah's Witnesses because they're good people. And it is a good, clean lifestyle. And if people are happy with it, why should I shake up their world? For whatever reason, I feel God called me out of it and called me to look at it. But I, I loved the truth that I was reading and learning. I invested my time that I was doing pioneering to do Bible study now. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting all these epiphanies, but I'm still living as a Jehovah's Witness going out in the ministry because I haven't officially left. So I would start asking people things like, um, you know, who's, who's our mediator? And they'd say, well, Jesus is. And I'm like, I didn't know you were anointed. And they're like, I'm not anointed. I said, well, according to this Watchtower publication, it's saying that Jesus is only the mediator for the anointed. They're like, he's my mediator. I pray in his name. I said, yeah, but technically, you know, and my husband knew what I was doing because he, he knew. He's like, will you stop doing that? But every single person from elders, pioneers, people who are really good students, they didn't know that, but it was hidden in there. Hmm. But I found out about it watching these videos from the apostates, <laughs> but it yeah. wasn't untrue. It wasn't apostate lies. It was truth. It's in their literature. You know, and the biggest mistake they made is when they started doing this JW broadcasting and they were showing up on our TVs and they were telling us, go get a Roku device and you can get the JW channel. And then we're seeing the governing body members where before they were just a name of oh, the governing body, but now we're seeing them. You know, I don't mean to be mean, but they were not impressive. They weren't charismatic where you would be like following because of that. Yeah. Yeah. They're imperfect. And that's what JWs will always say. Well, they're just imperfect men. Yeah. And my response is, then why are we following them? Because, the, well, they're spirit directed. Oh, well, this watchtower actually says we are not inspired, nor are we infallible. They put that in black and white. So if they're making mistakes, that's what that means. And we see that they have because we have all this new light. Mm -hmm. Then why are we following them? Why are we trusting what they're saying about blood transfusions or about disfellowshipping loved ones? Like, why can't we use our own Bible trained conscience to decide if someone is dangerous to us? Mm. When I listen to pastors or podcasts or whatever, I don't view it as something that I have to agree with. I view it as stimulate my mind. I'll go look up the scriptures and go, oh, mm. I never thought of it that way. And that's how my whole beliefs as I have them today have been shaped. So, at some point, you took a big leap and you ended up on YouTube saying these things out loud to the world. Yeah. How did that happen? So I started to reach out to the different ones doing XJW videos. I found out about some Bible studies that XJWs were having. I started to attend them. I started to hear the pain that people were having because here they were just trying to read through the book of Hebrews. And every time someone gave an answer, their pain from being involved in Watchtower, being a Jehovah's Witness, would come out. What, what does that mean? The pain would come out. So when you dedicate yourself to something for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, mm -hmm. and you've given up a lot of opportunities. I mean, some people gave up being parents because they were told, the end of the world's coming, don't have children. Oh. You didn't go get college educated. So now you're working as a house cleaner and having trouble making ends meet. So there's a lot of anger mm. from you having trusted this organization, thinking they were God's organization. And then people who've lost family members because they're no longer Jehovah's Witness, their family members are told to not have a relationship with that person, that it's a loving arrangement to bring them back. And that if you even give them just a little crumb of conversation, they'll be satisfied and they won't come back to Jehovah. The pain centers around all of that. Okay. And everyone has their own story. For me, I didn't have the loss of family. I did have the loss of friends. Okay. And I struggled so much. I'm thinking, if I struggled, I can't imagine how others who have a lot of family in struggle. 
there's a term we use, it's called PIMO. It means you're physically in, but mentally out. Mm. You know it's not the truth anymore, but you still are going to the meetings, you're going through the motions so that no one in your family knows. So you can maintain those relationships. And those are definitely people to pray for because they have to go and listen to stuff that they know is lies. Mm. And they can't bring any attention to themselves if they have any kind of doubts. So it's a hard life to live, but they make a choice. And I respect that choice. Some people just say, forget it. I'm disassociating. They write a letter. They leave. But what I was really shocked about is you're told a lot of people that leave did some gross sin. You know, like maybe they cheated on their spouse or they got involved in drugs. But I never thought in a million years people were getting disfellowship because they had doubts. And they express those doubts, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, you're allowed to have doubts, but you quickly realize that you need to be quiet about it yeah. and put it up on the shelf, you know. Yeah. So that's where the pain comes from. And that pain was popping up in your Bible study. Yeah. So it wasn't because like a passage in Hebrews was specifically triggering it. It's just that right. these were the pains in their life. Yeah. Okay. So from that, I decided, you know, maybe we should just have a support group where it's not a Bible study, but we're, we're people of faith just getting together to process the emotions of leaving a high control religious group like the witnesses. So I got a Zoom account and I had a couple people help me, you know, and this was in the middle of COVID when it first started. So I picked Saturday afternoon because, you know, all the days are blending together. Everyone was home on lockdown anyways. And it was great. People would come. We would just talk about our emotions. And um, so about after the fifth one, it was coming up on my year anniversary of waking up (laughs) because that's that's the terminology. When did you wake up? What woke you up Um, is how we would talk to each other. Yeah. And I had thought at one point I'd probably make some YouTube videos because I knew it helped me. And since I didn't have a lot of skin in the game, I felt that I could do that when the time was right. Okay. That particular day, I was telling them in the Saturday group, oh, it's a year since I woke up. You know, I was in pioneer school this day a year ago. Yeah. And (laughs) and I felt this compulsion. I had to make that video. I didn't want to yet. When I would pray, I would try and be quiet and just see what came up in my mind, what God was maybe trying to direct me to do. And I kept getting a picture of this green screen. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do that, but but not yet. I got this like really, so, like, no, today. I just, I'm like, uh, like, I'm like, all right, I'll do it today. So after that Zoom meeting, that support group, I fired the Zoom back up with just me in the room because I tend to overthink things. Oh, I got to get the better microphone. I, got, I said, no, just do it. I felt I was being told, just do it. Mm. And so I did. I got on and I just talked like you and I are talking. And I told my story. I shared it with a couple friends. And I'm like, is this okay? I mean, the video quality is horrible. They're like, yes, put it up. It doesn't matter about the video quality. It's the message. Hmm. To my shock, within like, I think a week, we got like over 20,000 views. I just checked today and I think it's 32,000. So it resonated with a lot of people me sharing my story. And in that video, I invited people to our support group. So we started to get more people to come. Yeah, We've now made it once a month. And I'll give you all that information you can put in the the show notes or whatever, if people want to check it out. But so I'm trying to be that person for them that I wish I had when I was waking Mm. up and felt so isolated and alone. A neutral person that's safe. You know, I'm not going to go share your information or report you and And then I asked other people if they wanted to do the same thing. So we started a buddy program. And so we have um, people that stand by. And I said, do you want to be connected with other people? We have a buddy program. We're like, sure. So I send a broadcast email out. And then they get all this love and, you know, contact with people. And they might resonate with one who happens to be a mom because they're a mom or resonate with the guy because he's a guy. And it's Mm. it's good. I'm I'm excited about it. So I tell my Mm -hmm. husband, I have a ministry. It's a little ministry. But I feel like I'm helping people, and they might be the Jehovah's Witness throwaway people, (laughs) but God loves us all. And I feel what I'm doing now is worth more than what I did 30 years as a Jehovah's Witness knocking on doors. And I'm splitting our conversation up into two parts. We talked a long time. And usually, editing finds all the best parts and makes it significantly shorter. But not this time. When I had 29 minutes of our conversation edited, 
and saw that I still had nearly an hour more content to work with, this, this writing appeared on the wall. Mine, mine, tekel um part two. So join me next time as Lorraine discusses how doctrinal issues came into play and more on the dynamics of waking up. The events page is here. It's live. Go to UnitarianChristianAlliance.org and click on Events in the menu. There's an upcoming events page and another page with instructions called Submitting an Event. And as promised, here is how this is going to sound. And for upcoming events, we have a June event in New York and a September one also in New York. Go to UnitarianChristianAlliance.org and click on Events to get to our listing of upcoming events. And there you can learn more. That's it. Nice and simple. And you can go and read more. But even better, if you have something which you know would be great for the broader Unitarian Christian community, let us know. We have instructions on how to submit your events right there with the events listing. Our UCA events coordinator will make sure we have the details right and then add it to the page. Amanda Dunn, thank you for being the coordinator. Now let's pack that list full. If you have thoughts or an audio bit that I could include, email podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. You can also click record in the show notes to transfer your words to my ears. A reminder that I attempt to include links to all the stuff mentioned in these podcasts, usually in the order that they show up in the podcast. If you know someone who is struggling their way out of a difficult, high-control situation, or who have emerged and are wanting to learn more about what others are doing, please recommend this episode. Laureen, I am so grateful for your patience with our long conversation. Fortunately, being featured in two episodes of the UCA podcast does result in twice the joy and double the thrills. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the second half. Your unique experiences are fascinating, and your passion for others like you is heartwarming. Thank you for what you're doing. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well. Not everybody understands the phrase green screen. Oh, okay. But it, it's the background that you have, which you can then switch to be something else. Like in your video, what did you have, palm trees? Yes, I did. Because <laughs> I said that represents me being in Florida now. Okay. Although someone hey, told me, well, that's from Hawaii, just so you know. I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> All right.